Now, I've been speaking with a lot of people that you might consider nice recently, and I've been noticing an archetypal problem among them all. My pattern recognition brain constantly sees that these nice guys, these nice people, hate themselves. Despite the fact that they might have what we understand as common, normy virtues, such as being selfless, being giving, caring more about others than themselves, being very, very nice in the foundation of what that is, they have a constant issue that I see all the time with a demonic force in their shoulder that is always putting them down, castigating them, making them feel awful about themselves, shaming them. Their conscience is their enemy. They have what we might call in common parlance a negative self-talk, a bully in their brain that won't let them go to sleep that won't let them do anything and fills them full of tension and horrible feelings whenever they try to take action upon the world. And the sort of archetype that I see is literally a person who, when I would ask them what did they value, what do they care about, what matters to them, and what do they see maybe as good or worthy of striving towards, they will always frame the selfish behavior, self selfless behaviors of giving to others and not caring about themselves and making sure that others' lives are easy and happy and joyful. And these guys are actually often Christian as well. So they, they personify many of the Christian virtues that we might understand. And they're hard workers in all senses of the world, but they're tortured. They're tortured inside their minds by a bully, by a demonic force that's putting them down. Now, why is this happening? What is happening with this? Now, I've pondered about this quite a lot, and I do have a suspicion that it might be something to do with the ability to be selfish and why that might in fact be a virtue that a lot of people overlook. But maybe even before we get to that, we could ask ourselves a question about, well, what is happening here? How can you have such a negative force when you're such an actively good force in your life? Now, for example, in Ion and by Carl Jung, Jung talks about this interesting problem of the shadow, the appearance of the shadow in our religion, in Christianity. So what you have is the creation of Christ, which is the perfect, the most goodest, bestest guy you could ever imagine, the glorious, innocent angel of pure life and pure hope and pure morality. And he is so good, so untouchable, so pure that it creates this sort of problem in the shared collective mind where we start to imagine what would be the opposite of this guy. We, we hypothesize there must be, if we're going to have something this pure, there must be a sort of opposite against this. There's always opposites. Our mind likes to play opposites day, devil's advocate, if you will. And so the creation of the opposite of this purity turns into something which we might call the negate or anti-Christ, the opposite of Christ. And this is this vision of this unpure, dirty, filthy, negative, cynical, pessimistic, and um, materialistic, all sorts of negative forces that come from this. And Jung sees that through through the journey of Christianity, the last 2,000 years, the, the, the personification of this negative force, this antichrist, has gone through quite an interesting journey in that initially it was uh, the, the absolute crux of evil. And then as we went through the thousands of years of evolution and development, people began to get very, very interested in this opposite, in the shadow of Christ. Christ and maybe even began to embrace him in some type of sense. And many of the virtues that the shadow of Christ had led us to some of the interesting technological revolutions, such as, for example, the Luciferian materialistic power of science and the ability to liberate ourselves from stringent morality in order for us to do anything we want. Of course, there's downsides to that, but in some sense, maybe there were upsides. Now, what you see operating within the mind of the nice guy, the nice Christian guy, is uh, the exact same force. Because when he's and forcing himself or reshaping his mind, recrafting his mind and following the principles of what he's been taught to be a good person, to be a good boy, to be a good dutiful man who serves others and is selfless. He creates inside of himself a shadow, an opposite, an opposite force, a, an antithesis, an anti-him, an anti-boyo, an anti-ego, if you will, which is this negative self-talk, this critic, this cynical, nasty person, this demon on the shoulder, the bad version of himself, the bad guy, the, the voice of the, the eternal pessimist in some type of sense, the, the voice of the selfish, cynical, nasty, mean opposite and shadow. And this is uh, the, the kind of thing that tears the nice guy apart because he has on the one hand this shining desire to be pure, which he understands as his persona and the way that he should operate in the world. And you have this other force that is honestly like ruthless, asking him to hurt himself, asking him to hurt other people, telling him all the ways that things can go wrong, trying to make him reject and uh, reduce life to nothing. It's like the devil inside of his head. And he might even understand it that way as like some type of demonic haunting force. Now, if you 
start to ask yourself some pretty interesting questions about like, is it possible that this purity, this selflessness, this niceness, this conception of being good, and you could say maybe is this conception of being good, this way that he wants to orientate himself or he's been taught to orientate himself is actually incorrect in relationship to human nature. Fundamentally, human nature is not that beautiful and that selfless and that perfect and that angelic as we make it out to be. And in your efforts to deny human nature and become something fake and a bit of a parody of what is real, you develop what Nietzsche called a bad conscience or what Jung called a shadow and opposite. You drift away from what your nature is, what you actually are, what your your body is and, and the way that life works. You create this very interesting problem inside of yourself. And so in the denial of the instincts, in the denial of your nature, in order for you to be nice, you actually create that evil force inside of you, that opposite force inside of you. So instead of having what might be a sort of rational skeptic inside of you, like if you're more connected with your body, maybe you're able to be more skeptical and you're able to be a bit more pessimistic. You're able to see maybe how things can go wrong and you can put yourself down a bit, maybe even have a bit of humor about yourself. But because you're not connected with life and the body and the true realities of human nature, this cynicism, this doubt, this skepticism um, distorts and and festers and turns rotten and turns into something extreme and something terrible and something awful and something that is far more than mere, you could say, skepticism, but actually like a radical cynicism, demonic in its force, demonic in its critiques and absolutely horrific because it's trying to balance the, you could say, false purity of your ego, false purity of you being nice. Now, I want to talk about that today and really dive into that because it opens up a litany of fascinating questions about shadow work and and the individuation process and what Jung might understand as the anima and all these litany of tools that the psychologists like Nietzsche and Jung have proposed to us that we need to use in order to improve ourselves and become as juicy as humanly possible. Now, what I notice when I'm working with this is that I have a suspicion of people who can't be selfish. Something just feels off about it. I'm a little bit of a girl. When you, you know, when a girl meets a guy who's too nice, it comes across as like creepy, as suspicious. No guy is this nice. Almost every guy, if I'm a beautiful girl, almost every guy on some level knows that I'm beautiful and has a set of instincts that are saying to him in his emotions, in his body, that he wants you. And if the guy shows up and he's being all nice and pretending that that's not really on the table at all and he's not thinking in this way, at all, the girl will feel suspicious. You sort of say, there's something wrong here because no man is separate from his instincts that much. There might be the rare few Buddhist priests who give off this aura of incredible selflessness or the, the true Christian, true Christian missionary who really has surrendered himself to the love of Christ and God that maybe will give off this energy where they genuinely don't have the problems of their instincts oscillating through them. But for the average person, for the vast majority of men, the girl will sort of be saying, right, this guy, he's feeling the tingles. He's He's feeling the urges, I know well, and I can see it in his eyes, but his words are coming across different. He's pretending that those instincts and those emotions aren't there. And I feel that as well. I feel a sort of um, suspicion about people who cannot be selfish, people who lead with too much selflessness and compassion and niceness and caring about others at the expense of themselves that gives off, uh, gives off a, 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 a problematic vibe for some reason. Now, I think the reason why this is, is because when you see people who are selfish, people who are very straightforward in what they want, very straightforward in their desires, very, very honest and transparent with what what's driving them, with the emotions oscillating through their body, it's very it's very charismatic when you see this. It, and it's quite a strange problem because we sit around and be like, why does everybody like the selfish guy? Why, that guy's just out for himself. Why does everybody find him so charismatic? I think it's because we recognize in him a transparency and an honesty and we actually understand a sincerity and we, in some sense, admire his bravery to be able to represent his desires so straightforward and so clearly because it's actually hard to stand for what you want it's really really difficult to do that so when you meet someone who's like i want this this is what i want and i'm a guy who goes for what i want and that's a very strong and powerful feeling to be around but when you find people who are selfless and they don't go for what they want and they go for something else or something like this it becomes it, it, it clicks with your head there's something a little bit off about it and i think it's because what the self selfish person represents, what the guy who goes for what he wants represents, is someone who's representing their, his instincts. He's, he's transparent. He's, he's sincerely 
operating as the vessel, the tool for his instincts to achieve what he wants to achieve. Now, I would say in, an, in, in a foundational level that then the person who is too selfless or inauthentically selfless is someone who is representing not what his instincts want, but representing what his abstract, noggonist morality wants, what he had been maybe taught when he was younger, what the sort of shame and conceptual worldview has been put inside of his head. And of course, the, 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 the challenge and the problem he's having inside of his mind of dealing with this bad concept to be better and be good and be all these type of things. Now, what, what's interesting about this is that, of course, we would all suggest that being nice and being good and being moral in, in a conceptual way is, is, is nice and good and moral and all these type of things. But it's, if, is it really that good? Is it really that good if it's in denial of what you are, of what your instincts are, of what your body is, the creation of the animating energy inside of you? Is it really that good to be moral and be good if it's denying what nature has made you, what God, because God didn't make mistakes, did he? God, when God built you in that body of yours and he asked nature to fill you full of the animating energies that move you around, he's hardly, he's hardly said, whoops, sorry about that. Jesus, I kind of blundered there a little bit, made every single one of them have a set of instincts and desires that drive them towards certain things. And it was actually a mistake. I actually said, fuck. So what I got to do is get them to, you know, get them to deny all those instincts and break them and go against them and, 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 and fix that problem. Ah, oh, what silly old me god i i should play sims a bit more to kind of build up this ability of world building because i'm not really doing a great job with this first try and i've already fucked it up well i guess on to a new reality i'll try something else these poor guys are just gonna have to play out this video game to see it through to the end i don't think he's like that i don't think god is out there i don't think the lord is out there making all these blunderous mistakes in this type of way the way you've been designed is that you've got these animating instincts that drive you towards specific goals and in some sense they are what you are now, this is where I see, for example, Jung and Nietzsche becoming extremely relevant to help us understand ourselves in the modern context, because we can't really graph old ideologies over the modern context and really make sense of it. it to, to understand what instincts are, we, we fundamentally are our instincts. In fact, you could understand the instincts as the animating energies inside your body that get you to do things. When you're walking down the street and you see a girl, your animating instincts will fill you full of cortisol or adrenaline or whatever it is to make you feel all these feelings of desire towards the girl or you're walking down and you see a big beautiful meal you're going to get all these feelings of uh, i don't know what the hormones are called i think it's lectin or something like this that makes you feel desire and hunger towards that food when you see things that you want see things that your your instincts and nature understands is valuable towards the advancement of your body and advancement of your form you're going to feel emotions that push you towards this. And so what your soul is, what, what actually your psyche is, and remember your anima means soul, what your psyche is, is a, a collection of things that animate you to make decisions and choices and act in the world, that your motivations, the things that drive you towards per your purpose, try to drive you towards your goals and try to drive you towards all these type of things. The anima, the animating instincts that drive you are the instincts. Uh, the animating things that drive you are the instincts. And in some sense, you can understand Jung's proposition of the individuation process is suggesting this for you as well. For example, he says that your first problem will be you'll have an ego and there'll be the opposite of this ego, this shadow. And when you really overcome that properly, you will dive down deeper and find out that the shadow is not really exant. It's like a fog. But when you go down really, really to the very, very bottom of what you are, you'll see that the, the real thing that's pulling the strings underneath you is the animated power of your soul, the animated instincts, the anima inside of you, your soul, the drives inside of you. And your great challenge is to build a relationship with that and understand how that is pushing you around. And if you don't develop this, you can't have things like personality. You can't have things like a, a holistic way of seeing things. And you're always going to be perpetually in, in struggle with the, the, the higher, um, the, pro, the intellectual masturbatory problems up inside of your head. Without an instinctive embodied soul, you're not really a person at all. You're just a lark a larper of a human, a noggonist, a jargonite, a information guy, a abortion of the modern regime and world. And so what we are is our instincts and they give us personality. When we really connect with our instincts, they animate us and make us entertaining to be around. It makes us um, enjoyable to be around because you see um, energy inside of people and energy is always joyful to be around. To people, this is why the selfish person is often so charismatic because it's joyful to be around someone who's going for what they want, who's honest about what they want, who's representing presenting the instincts that animate us all in an uh, unabashed and brave way that pulls us forward. 
Now, the problem is, is that you are a vessel for nature to overcome the tyranny of death. And when you go along with her, her, her struggles, when she's, she's wired you with these millions of years of, of, of instincts and, and, and things like this, and when you go along with them, she will give you energy because through you, she is operating and achieving her goal. And so she's filling you full of life force. And this gives you that type of charisma. Fundamentally, these instincts are self-interested. And the problem, the dichotomy with, with which I see in the nice guy with this um with this with this very happy, good, self selfless ego, and then this very, very negative, challenging, putting himself down, conscience, bad conscience, is that these things are only really created and exant because they don't have a grounding in this true instinctive way of operating. And the selfish person would probably have a bit of an ego and a bit of a bad conscience but they wouldn't be near as strong, nor near as distorted, nor near as extreme because they've got a sort of um, force, a soul that holds them down and makes them understand what they are. So I want to talk a little bit more about how you can begin to discover your soul to make sure that you have a grounding so that you don't turn into someone who's bullying yourself or worse, an information guy or a jargonite or an organist. Now, many of these nice guys, when I propose these ideas, would often say stuff like, oh my God, I've spent my whole life not listening to my instincts. That's shocking. I can't do that. And what starts to happen is that they will continue to be in denial of this and they'll struggle with this. And in some sense, it's not necessarily like they're um, in denial in a bad way. It's just that they really do struggle to sit down and listen to their instincts and overcome what you might understand as the social programming that has been happening to them for decades that have taught them to be ashamed of everything self-interested. And it's just a real difficult problem for them. But what begins to happen sometimes is that that negative bad conscience begins to sort of seep in like a shadow, like Tyler Durden begins to seep in and start to turn them into something quite cynical. Suddenly they're saying words or sentences that are snappy and nasty, like biting aggressive things. It's like almost like the nice guy facade is beginning to crack and the shadow is then bursting out and trying to swallow it up and forcing the integration process to happen. And of course, what what I would say in order to avoid you turning into a dickhead for a couple of uh, years and then finally integrating the shadow and then maybe getting closer to something like this, there's a way that you can actively subvert that process and as quick as possible and cleanly as possible, get back in touch with a grounded soul and a grounded self-interest that allows you to be more authentic as a person and still be, come across as good. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But the problem that a lot of these guys have is that when I suggest this, they're like, uh, are, you, are you saying that I must become greedy? Are you saying that I must just give in to my lower instincts? Do I just run around and just start masturbating all the time and watching porn all day? Do I go in and I just like rob a bank? Like, is that how things going to work? And of course, that is not true at all because this is, again, this problem where you're stuck in a very strong extremist false dichotomy and then you, you see everything in the same sort of light. For example, when I say listen and be transparent with your instincts, uh, assumes that you must then extremely surrender to your instincts and allow them to entirely lead you, which is not quite what I'm saying at all. I'm saying you must begin to build a relationship with your soul and understand these instincts and what they are and learn how to work with them. And that's a very difficult problem. But Nietzsche and Jung both constantly talk about this. This is Jung's individuation process. And this is Nietzsche's path towards the Ubermensch, the Overman, as he specifically said. And there's very like a, a many amounts of quotes that specifically talk about this. Nietzsche himself would say that the, the Overman is he who can bend all of his, his the chaos of his passions towards one will and then become creative. That is how you be, uh, create yourself in that type of regard. And this is exactly what he's talking about. You have all these instincts and passions inside of yourself. Can you grab them and shuttle them towards one clear direction, an honest direction that pushes you in the right way? But this is a struggle for people. People can't embrace these instincts. They can't go into them because they see uh, this idea of surrendering to them fully and becoming a, a porn hub loving grug who's running around eating burgers all day and, and, and listening to uh, just consuming and just being a complete amoral degenerate in this type of regard. And that, of course, is not true. Although I understand why people think this, because what you see is that our world is trapped in this false dichotomy. You see that Edward Bernays managed to levy and leverage the power of Sigmund Freud and the understanding of Sigmund Freud about the existence and the denial of these instincts, these deep drives underneath us. And he took this stuff and he leveraged it and used it in order to create, you know, identity marketing, 
sexuality marketing and um, jealousy marketing envy, mar envy marketing and he basically invented the premises of s mass social engineering and modern capitalism that allowed people to drill into your brain that what you are is a identi identityless consumer that needs to take all these products in order to even exist and you need to connect your libido and your your your, your lower urges and just give in to them and surrender to them and impulse buy and all these type of things act on impulse smoke the cigarette it's sexual power eat eat the food eat the burger you deserve it hedonism all these type of things this is the sort of um, horrendous job that has been done to our mind the creation of the century of the self as they say that is um, that is allowed uh, that, that often causes people to see this surrendering to the instincts in such a horrific and degenerate way I understand it um, but it is not the truth just because this is what the mainstream the population the most horrific villains in the world have done doesn't mean that this is the correct way that things will work nor the true way that things actually work when you do this well and um, modern life is a buffet of lower instincts but you notice that this actually creates the sort of same shadow problem in the modern society where for this reason modern people are unbelievably soft and and and, and too comfortable and puritan in some ways and neurotically nice and more ideological than you could ever imagine they really lack souls in some sense they really have you know, they, they, they spend their whole lives being a hedonist, consuming products, watching porn, and being degenerate in all sorts of ways. And then in order to compensate for all this embrace of the Antichrist and sin and the fallen world, in order to compensate for the buffet of the instincts that they've went through, you see the sort of standard normal person as wanting to grab on to some type of ideological Puritan um, thing, a simplistic, poor thinking, ideological Puritan desire. And so what happens is you have people like any, you know, you just dangle in front of them any moral movement at all anything any new what's the new kind of chick moral um, moral outrage that we're going to pick up now and they will grab onto that because it will give them meaning it will make them feel good it will make them feel um, it will bring back the, the, the kind of place that Christ used to hold inside their minds that stop making them feel guilty for the hedonism and the indulgence in their instinct they feel like there's something higher to them because they're fighting for the cause or fighting for this new meme that's probably probably just a consequence of more marketers who have more advanced this stuff and realize that social engineering can go to the point of like social movements and all this type of stuff and you're you're trapped in that sort of um, mincemeat grinder of all this type of stuff to play on the instincts the dangling of moral carrots and all this type of stuff and you're like no I don't want to be a part of that at all I want I don't want to go near the instincts because they create these type of problems but but this is ultimately this culture war that people are often talking about is 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 is, is an inauthentic um, fight uh, it's an inauthentic way of seeing what we are what our instincts are what our drives truly are when ultimately what you're trying to do is break out of that and develop an authentic relationship with yourself so that you have an authentic coherent identity that's not based on false dichotomies it's not based on being too nice but based on the true life force and passion that operates within you the will and the energy that operates within you that God has programmed you in and nature has um, coddled throughout the, 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 the span of time so that you have a solid identity that cannot be pulled apart by all these filthy marketers and their silly little games in order to turn you into some type of brain dead last man that they can extract milk out of like you're some type of cow this is why you notice this weird word that Nietzsche and Jung would say which is become what you are oh because stand on top of a mountain and look out across the fog and say become what you are and it's not it's ultimate jargon you know it's one of those annoying quotes that you hear all the time but when you think about it this is sort of what they're suggesting what you are is this set of instinctive powers these animating powers inside of you and they will make you what you are if you connect with them and allow them to lead you and develop a co coherent relationship with this they will lead you towards the the ideal version of yourself as Nietzsche says you bend the chaos of the passions towards one direction you tame the passions towards one direction instead of surrendering them you tame them and they will lead you towards what you are and it takes honesty and courage to do this it's a difficult problem to get this right it's very very hard to be transparent with your instincts and it's very difficult to discipline your instincts overcome them and point them in a, a sophisticated way towards something because what you're sort of doing what you sort of are is that you've got all these like it's like a load of fires or maybe laser beams shooting up in the air and it's chaotic you know you've got your sexual desire pushing you one way and your desire to be liked by people and your desire to be seen as a, a high status person and your greed and all these things are all pointing in different directions and 
what you as the, the, the man on the path towards the Ubermensch, you as the person trying to work this stuff, is you grab all these laser beams and you try to bend them all together so that they all unify into one laser beam and go in one direction. That's really what he's talking about. And this is the mastery and working of the instincts. But of course, Edward Bernays and his clique, what they want you to do is, oh, no, 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 point that laser beam there. Like uh, They want to control the laser beams. They want to shine. They want to extract as much value out of those laser beams as they can. And you, you must build a coherent true soul or else you won't even you'll just be a NPC a noggonist walking around in this modern world of of super noggonist magicians who will be able to suckle all your power out of you and turn you into nothing a great example of this for example uh, from from women is the problem of the 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 neurotic modern woman she she struggles to relate with her body and she's assaulted by uh, like women are the most marketed two people in the modern world and they're just assaulted by all of these ad campaigns and all this type of stuff that are pulling at their instincts and pulling at their identity in all sorts of different ways edward bernays for example exploited in a genius way women's desire for liberation through the feminist movement by you know getting a load of patriarchs like a small group of men in who sell cigarettes and then he got them to um, make a marketing campaign that showed cigarettes as representing women's freedom and of course this gave the cigarette companies access to a huge uh, like an entire half of the market they didn't have and so these guys made millions and millions and millions while women thought they were getting free because women were getting mind fucked by the likes of Bernays who've been using psychology on them and all these type of things and of course what, what, what has happened is that you know these guys see women as these cash cows that they can just exploit and play with their identity and their emotions and so the modern woman shows up and she completely misunderstands her body she's being sold all sorts of things like pills and cigarettes and identities and all this type of stuff like it's assaulting her from all type of ways to try grab her at her identity and she she lives this sort of hollow shell of a life she has no soul she she hates herself she she's in terrible states of depression and she's struggling in all sorts of ways because of what has been done to her by all these forces and in order for her to overcome this she needs to like exactly like these guys needs to reclaim her soul and reconnect to what she is and reconnect to what her physiology and her body is and reconnect what her, what her instincts is and become an embodied person and reanimate herself in order to push herself forward. So what I want to talk to you about now is the actual process that you can go through in order to do this. How do you bend all these instincts together in order to develop yourself to the highest level? So we'll get into that now. Now, I specifically want to focus on this problem of spiritualizing the passions. This is what the individuation process is about. This is what Nietzsche would talk about quite a lot. And it's basically about working with those forces inside of you and beautifying them, making them serve you in the highest way possible. Like they're, they're, all the passions, think of it like the colors on a, a paint, on a paint palette. All these passions, there's these little fire, these colorful fires. It's like a Pokemon or something like this, it's like some type of game that you can play. And you need to grab them all and steer them towards one direction so that you're empowered and animated animated by them as opposed to pulled apart by them or worst of all you try to blow them all out because you're afraid of them you can't work with them now the problem of spiritualizing the passions is extremely difficult and sophisticated it's very very hard to sit down with someone and install within them the awareness of what the passions are and then the discipline for them to control the passions and the vision for them to understand why they should be doing this and where they should be going with this type of things but you can see it through the ancient past the ways that people have often done this the catholics for example would have the schema of the seven deadly sins which we all think famously understand that a lot of modern people would sort of be like oh the the stiff catholics and all this type of stuff but actually think about what was going on there they're sort of suggesting to you that you've got this seven forces inside of yourself you know uh, lust uh, hunger greed gluttony pride and all these type of things and they're, they're what they're doing is they're um, they're saying to you that these are these laser beams they're shooting out of you and they're they're if you let them lead you you will turn into an animalistic horrific grug and then some marketer will come along and you know uh, ancient marketers will go along and get you addicted to heroin or prostitutes and then get you loan shark and then kill you or something like this um, and so they would say that what you need to do is you need to constrict these passions now they would work a little bit more extreme maybe than the way I'm talking here but nonetheless you can see the logic towards what they're doing they take the average person and say look your problem is you need to constrict your lust you need to constrict your gluttony constrict your greed and point it towards something higher and then they would give them the seven angelic virtues which was the opposite of this which is that you take these fallen virtues and you beautify them you you take these energies and you you divine them so for example they would look at your sexual lust needs to be channeled into a correct and well orchestrated monogamous marriage and that's actually a very smart idea because they're not denying they're not saying to you oh you need to castrate yourself like all the priests do 
or, 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 or live a life as perfect as Jesus. They're not saying that at all. They're saying you want to fuck. Like, we get it. But what you need to do is you need to do that within the context. You know, like, you can fuck your wife as much as you want, but it has to be within the context of a consolidated, logos oriented marriage. And you can have as many babies as you wish. Go absolutely nuts, because that makes more Catholics. We love that buzz. But you have to constrict it and channel the thing in this type of way. And they do it with all the other ones as well. They're trying to get you to take the passion and steer it in a certain direction. That's fucking smart. As much as you might not like the church or something like this, it's very, very clever. And you see um, this in everything, Buddhism, all the same type of thing. They're trying to orchestrate a way for you to control your passions, discipline them, and work with them. Like Buddha doesn't say castrate yourself. Actually, the big part of Buddha's story is that he learns the correct way to go is the middle way. You must go in a temperate way. You're not going to castrate yourself. You're not going to deny yourself and starve yourself. What you're going to do is you're going to go in the middle. You're going to do things that are moderate and temperate in order to keep everything sorted out. You can eat. Just don't excessively eat and glutton, glutton yourself, you know? And what we'll do is we'll manage these lower passions like hunger and sex and lust and all these type of things. I want you to manage them by serving them, but disciplining them in a reasonable way so that we can begin to create inside of you higher virtues. And this is where, for example, the Buddhist obsession with developing through meditation the ability to experience universal compassion. And that's a very smart thing. And they achieve that in many levels. Even science has kind of backed it up. And I'm sure that if, you, if people wanted to study the Catholics, you would see something similar where they create in people these higher virtues through the, the works that they offer to people. It's this type of thing. These ancient religions were struggling with these problems just like we are and doing quite, quite well. And of course, Jungian psychology and various things like Nietzsche and all this stuff comes along and suggests to us that this process needs to happen for us as well. We're not free from this. We're not, we're not suddenly able to just run around and be hedonists. Like we do need to have a schema and the way that we can work with the passions and the way that we can struggle with the passions. And so Jungian psychology would propose to you, you know, the individuation process, very jargon heavy, very noggin'ous stuff. I, like, I almost never see it working because I, I don't think it's put down on a simple enough level. But think about what he's saying. He's sort of suggesting in a similar way. You have, you, what you'll initially experience is a sort of negative uh, uh, opposite of your ego. And then you get in contact with the animating force inside of you, your soul. And you have to understand that that's there. And you need to begin to work with this and embrace the dark side embrace the dark side and the animating side that the soul is offering and integrate all this stuff in understand it make it a part of yourself and allow it to lead you forward in a in a proper way and that's a, like you know it, it makes sense in a coherent way as well now the, what i'd like to do is actually break down and talk to you specifically about the actual instincts as they show up because this is fundamentally what people actually deal with on a grounded day-to-day -day, day problem like how do you deal with sexual desire fear and anxiety anger envy and understand these type of things and also a very important thing is that when you lock down these lower things, what begins to happen with the possibility of authentic instincts giving birth to what we understand as higher virtues? The nice guy who wants to be compassionate and wants to be good and wants to be um, gentle and selfless and all this type of stuff doesn't understand that if you dive deep enough into your soul, you will discover that your soul has all those virtues. You just don't get to access them without embracing what your soul is in a holistic and full way and becoming a true individual. So first things first, the big question that most people are going to ask is like, all right, Steph, we're talking about instincts. The one I'm thinking about is the very, very animalistic drug instinct that the sexual desire lust. I want to, I want to bang. Steph, I'm here. You're talking about all this psychology stuff. Like just cut to the fucking chase. How do I, how do I release my lust? How is this psychology stuff going to help me not? Like that's really what I'm sort of here for. And um, now what, what I would always say to people, because for example, you'll see people get extremely puritan about this, like the, you, you see a sort of oscillation because modern hedonistic society is highly sexualized. And then you see people going to an absolute um, massive restriction where they're either falling into inceldom or they're going like vol cell voluntarily. They want to um, go for celibacy or something like this. And they're denying sexuality and they say it's evil. They start to go in this type of direction. And to be honest, I understand it. Like it's a reaction against the sort of horrific liberalism and hedonism of the modern society that is, you know, actually pushed largely by people like Edward Bernays. But more than anything, this is not this argument and this bickering about what sexuality is and is, if it, is it good to have sex or bad to have sex, it's useless. It's too simplistic. Instead, we should try to understand what the desire is at its root. You have to ask yourself serious questions about, like, why, why do you desire sex? Like, what's going on? So, as I said, God's running this whole Minecraft server that we all live on. And through nature, through life, through the life forces, he, he, he fills us full of instincts that push us towards doing things. And the most basic goal that life is having is she's fighting 
fighting against entropy in order to ov overcome the challenges of time and death. And so sex is the, the foundational way that, that, that this is achieved. And the lust and the desire inside of you basically wants the most beautiful, which actually means fertile and biologically strong, the most beautiful partner you can possibly have who can produce very strong and healthy and beautiful children and is able to raise them so that they're powerful and strong and able to extend for long periods of time um, and, and overcome things and become Alexander the Great. This is what you're looking for, strong sons. Like this is, this is your energy. This is what your sexuality looks for. And through when, when it's uh, looking for a woman or looking for a man, if you're a girl, what it's looking for is that exact ideal. It's looking for beauty. It's looking for power, strength, virtues. It's looking for good things inside of the character and so when you truly embrace your your sexuality and, and look down on your desires and all this type of stuff you'll, you'll suddenly realize that your sexual lust is not that degenerate especially if you're if you're really working with it and understanding it it's not it's not it's not telling you to go out and just be a an animal banging stuff on the street maybe there's a part of it that sort of has says hey fuck it bro like just go for it but mainly it's not like that at all in fact what it wants is it wants you know oftentimes few I mean, like maybe a few beautiful girlfriends might be the absolute apex of it or something like that maybe the muslims are right but it's looking for high standards it's looking for exceptional beauty and in some sense things to go along with that as well like very very strong chemistry intelligence it asks for these type of things your lust is really driven towards standards it's not necessarily like a uh, just everything don't don't think about it in this type of way it wants beauty it wants really really high quality stuff it's looking for fertility on its very 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 foundational level and you have to understand this because you start to understand an awful lot about emotions when you experience this in some sense this gives you so much power when you embrace your sexuality this way because you will dismiss things that are not really what you're looking for you'll start to become more clear about what you want you'll start to become more clear that you're not just a desperate needy guy who just wants to get himself into a warm hole or something like that but instead you're someone who's looking for something of extremely high quality so you can operate nature's gold which is creating strong powerful children that are going to move the world forward and all these type of things and th that's really the root of it and if you really connect with that you're in a great place whereas most people I meet who would be the most shall we say degenerate or they, they, they would be most uh and unthinking and casual about sexuality they would often like I often hear this where they say I don't want children there's a denial of the actual nature of the instinct I don't want children I don't think I, I think children are evil I think children are annoying I sometimes hear as well and there's this castration of the instinct even though they embrace the pleasure they, they don't actually embrace the instinct they don't don't embrace the will and the power of the instinct whereas when you think about it like there's nothing more profound than you know bonding together in romance with someone who's so beautiful that you want to make a child with them because you know that the child will be healthy and strong is going to take over the world that's there's there's nothing more satisfying to your lust than that there's nothing more satisfying than that because it's a, an incredible statement of physical and beautiful psychological and spiritual power when that sort of chemistry is between two people and this is really what this desire is asking for and if, if you don't sit down and explore that and really work with that you you leave yourself and this is what i mean but you need to work with the passions and understand them and spiritualize them and idealize them because you will fall into the dichotomous thinking where you'll either say sex is evil and i have have to you know become a celibate priest or the opposite where you just casually pretend that it's like not a big deal or something like that when in fact it is the most serious charge probably inside your body on the most fundamental level and the big idea when you're going to see this in all of them is the standards question because when you lock that in it, a lot of things begin to go right it's so much more attractive for a girl to meet a guy who has standards and actually knows what he wants and has a vision for what he wants because then she feels that it's like oh my god I have to earn this guy and it's so much more compelling for her emotions because she's ultimately ultimately deep down in her desires looking for someone with high standards she's looking for a high standard guy herself as well now next beyond that is the question of fear and anxiety because this is i would say besides sexuality the other anchor of the mind sex is like the success of the primal challenges of life and fear is like the 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 opposite guardian against the the primal challenge of life which is danger and death and so at, at the root of your anxiety when you explore and work with your anxiety a lot of people see anxiety and maybe you know that demon on the shoulder the nice guy's experiencing they see it as some type of evil enemy as some type of thing that's trying to make them feel bad about themselves and bully them and, and it's like they're tortured by some type of entity that's in their way but of course they never sit down and think coherently about why do you feel fear why do you feel anxiety why is this stuff attacking you what's going on of course they're 
excuse the burp I'm, I'm, my belly's being like all right here interrupt him here body saying look i am your soul here i get i get to have a say and your fear and your anxiety is usually pinging off a vision of the future or a, a, a representation of chaos in your world or something like this and it's trying to um send out the radar and say oh there's a problem there's chaos there there's something that you're not in control of around you and if you were more competent, if you had more power, if you had more confidence and success and created more structures and put together more resources and built out more stable systems around you, that moment of chaos wouldn't be there. Like, for example, there's someone who's intimidating. Where if you knew how to fight, you wouldn't be as afraid because you'd know that you'd be able to stand up to that type of person. Your fear levels would go down. The more you create order within the chaos of these extreme experiences, the more your fear begins to go away because it's like you're answering its challenge. It's saying you're not good enough in so many different levels and you need to raise your standards and develop more control and competence with these things either the the chaos of the the situations around you like violence or 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 social shame or something like this and also then the problems of the future which is what anxiety often pushes us towards what if this goes wrong what if this goes wrong what if this goes wrong and your challenge is then understanding how this fear works and working with it in order to put in place your ability to overcome this and of course developing a very foundational ability for you to do brave things in the face of fear for you to respond against fear because fear is a very fascinating passion and emotion to work with because in some sense it, it, it does point you towards things you, you don't have control over but in another sense it's almost like a, a, a kind of screechy girlfriend she, she, she might be a bit dramatic sometimes it might be a bit delusional sometimes your anxiety can just be completely ridiculous sometimes your fear can be really really like useful to point you towards the dangerous thing but a little bit over the top in terms of the way that it expresses yourself and so your true challenge the true relationship you must build with this fear and this anxiety is to show it that first of all you're not going to necessarily just assume that everything it says is correct you know that you can be delusional in your fear and you also can prove that you can stand up and do courageous things in the face of fear you're not necessarily a coward who always just listens to their whiny girlfriend you're the leader inside here and the whiny girlfriend is trying to sort of alert you that she's scared of stuff but you're grabbing her by the hand and taking her towards destinies and moving her towards things you're the brave operator and carrier and when you actually build this inside of yourself this ability to work with your fear this way it becomes the foundation for all the other virtues because you develop this ability to be brave to be courageous and be uh, someone who is not suff- uh, a, a victim to your own fear in this type of regard fear and your ability to overcome it by courage and thus virtue is the foundation for every other relationship you have with these emotions and most importantly of all because all of the emotions demand standards just like fear does demand you to be more competent and in control and these standards are always a risk for you to go for standards it's always a risk and it's always dangerous for you to raise the standards to to go for something higher and so your ability to overcome fear allows you to access risk and overcome risk and then raise your standards which allows you to do so many profound things with your life it is the foundation of being a hero now the challenge of getting for example the nice guy who is not connected with their emotions to actually do the very very difficult problem of going down into for example their lust or their sexual desire and learning the very shocking thing that your lust and your sexual desire it's it's naked self-interest of wanting the highest standard pa- partner you could possibly have is extremely noble and good this is what it keeps life ascendant and keeps life raising up and you have to understand that all the emotions are in some sense working in this type of direction well this is this is very very difficult for for people to find in the emotion of anger and frustration and you could even say the competitive aggressive nature inside of people to for example push back or maybe even assert aggressively what they want at these type of regards but it's really really important to understand that there's there is a naked self-interest inside anger frustration and aggression that is extremely healthy and noble because fundamentally the anchor of what anger and frustration are is that they it's a desire for a higher standard you only really get angry when there's something in your reality that is not good and you your, your your emotions say that it's that this is not this is not good enough i want better i deserve better i desire better i wish that you know the, even these little things like there's some noise i'm trying to record this podcast and there's some noise and i'm thinking to myself i've got to work harder so i can get to a position where i'm not for example in a city or something like this where i'm struggling with these little like people using power drills like in the in the next door or something like this i need to keep on working to build myself up into a position where i am free to create a space that doesn't 
suffer from these type of problems. I need to raise my standards is what my anger sort of says to me. I feel that jolt of like, Arr, the sound, how do I get rid of the sound? And of course the answer comes to me, oh, well, I need to work harder in order to build up the ability to overcome this type of stuff. The frustration, the anger is pushing me higher, is pushing me to ascendant understandings. And my desires are often tied to an aggression and an anger. The things that I want, make it makes me angry that I don't have them. The things that I wish I could create, it makes me frustrated that I wasn't, I'm not able to, you know, create the most perfect artistic brand, not be able to create the most perfect YouTube channel, the perfect um, YouTube video or something like this. It gets annoying and it gets angry and it makes me, you know, makes me grind my teeth. It makes me scratch my eyes out. Why aren't I that good? But of course I can um, pr- come up with some cope ideology that gets me to deny that, oh, well, you know, I'm good enough as I am and all these type of things. Maybe that's a little bit important to be present and accepting of what you are. But ultimately I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to castrate my anger. I wouldn't want to turn my anger off and say to myself, all right, well, I don't need to advance. I don't need to iterate or improve or perfect myself in any type of ways. I actually quite like the sort of um, frustrated and angry nature that I that will pop up in me from time to time because it does always push me ascendantly. And over the long, long years, you know, people I've met and people who've come in and out of my life and I meet them, you know, five years later, 10 years later, it's actually so interesting to watch how much I've changed because I've been driven this way compared to them who sort of stay in this operant area of statesis. They, they stay, maybe we could say mediocre. I don't mean to be too offensive, but this type of thing, they don't, they don't evolve. They don't transform because there's maybe not that aggression, that anger, that assertion inside of them pushing them towards this type of stuff. And so when a, a nice guy who's struggling to care about himself and stand up for himself, he can't get angry about things because he feels bad about it. He feels ashamed of wanting to assert himself. He actually struggles with a lot of very serious problems because, first of all, he'll never be able to raise his own standards and raise standards for people around him. For example, when you get angry at someone and ask them to raise their standards, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You might hurt their feelings, but raising their standards is not going to, it's, it's not going to damage them. It's not bad for them at all. In fact, you know, say you have someone who is eating very unhealthy and starting to get overweight and develop bad health problems. And you can see that in 10 years, if they keep this stuff up, they might be in a very terrible position. And if you start to get angry at them and you start to criticize them and explain to them that you want them to raise their standards out of love, like a sort of tough love situation, you're just like, no, you're better than this. Raise your standards. You're annoying me the way you constantly lack a discipline and all these type of things. It's annoying. It's, it's, disgusting to be around it's difficult to be around my bad habits come out when i'm around you you can you can really fight them and attack them and maybe there'll be this bickering and this debate and see if you really love them you'll, you'll stay in the trenches and keep on fighting against them but eventually you'll break them and then they'll 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 embrace it and they'll begin to raise their standards you could save their fucking life you could save their life and you'll hurt their feelings in all the different ways but you could save their life now are you are you seriously telling me you're a good guy if you don't want to save their life you want to just keep them feeling nice because you don't want to get angry you don't want to hurt their feelings you're not a good guy at all you're actually just a coward you're just someone who's afraid of doing what is right you're not even a moral person you're afraid of of raising standards because ultimately morality is tied to raising standards because the instincts when you understand them properly despite the fact that you've head fucked yourself and been head fucked into think that the instincts are the ultimate opposite of morality actually know They are the source of morality. When you spiritualize the instincts, spiritualize the passions, they create morality because they create ascendant standards. They raise standards for everyone else and they require you to be riskful and brave in the face of the fear of creating these standards and they push everything up. And if you're able to embrace them, you will achieve all these things you're looking for, such as goodness and morality and bravery and and excellence and all these type of things because they come from these. These are the animating forces that drive them. Think, for example, of something like envy. Envy is the same question. I sort of stole this off Nietzsche a little bit, but envy is not a signal when you see someone else succeeding and you're like, I wish they, I hope they fail. And that's, that's, I hope they, they do bad. Or I hate seeing them win. This, this is a misunderstanding of what the emotion is saying, because ultimately that resentment is, is you not listening to the blunt reality of the envy that hits you first. Ultimately you, you want what they have. You admire what they have. You're jealous of their success because you wish that you had the accolades and the success and the blazing drama of all these type of things. Envy is a good thing. Envy, again, is trying to get you to lift your standards. Your rival, your competitor, your friend even, is succeeding and you get jealous of them. And if you don't have a good relationship with this emotion, you will distort this into a spiteful, crab-in-the-bucket, resentful attitude that will make you slowly try to subvert and pull down their success. But if you have a good relationship with your envy, you'll immediately recognize as you're sort of saying to yourself these negative things about people, you'll very quickly 
recognize, oh, that's the, the envy coming up. So what I need to do is raise my standards and you'll do the right thing. You'll raise your standards and respond correctly to competition, to loss, to failure, to getting beaten. And you'll raise your standards, work hard and build yourself up in this type of regard. That's the correct way to work with envy. But often the nice guy, and this is actually a classic example of the nice guy. This is the classic example of the creep, the, the, the sort of priestly type in that they feel very strong envy and they can't sincerely relate to it because they haven't done all this work on their soul. And so what happens is the envy festers. It, it, it is not worked with properly. It turns into that resentment where that whole thing where you want them to fail actually becomes a real serious reality. And suddenly you get animated because this is what you're looking to be is animated by the shadow of envy, resentment, which is pushing you to do all sorts of horrible things where you spend your time trying to make this person fail, trying to make this person lose. You're focused on making a winner lose instead of making yourself a winner. And that's the incorrect relationship with something like envy. And that comes from not embracing it properly. On your sort, You'll sort of say it in a selfless way. You'll even come up with rationalizations and cope and noggonism to support this. You'll say stuff like, oh, well, that, that, that person winning, and they're evil. Look at them. They're selfish. They're the bad person. Oh, they're a, a lustful, desirous, um, egregious person. I hate them. Let's pull them down. Grab them by the leg and strip them down you're like a crab that grabs the person escaping the bucket and pulls them down and says no you shall not escape this is we're we're all down here together in the hell that i've created and you're going to stay here with me now this is a very important thing to get right because you can see that you if you don't get your if you don't relate with your emotions properly through for example something like envy again you despite being the nice guy can turn into a force of evil you can become the worst person possible because you think that you're a good person and the resentment is animating you because you don't allow your normal emotions to, re to animate you so you can only get resented by the shadows of the normal emotions and you become a resentful spiteful little shit who actually tries to stop winners from succeeding and bickers and criticizes and chops at their feet to make sure that nothing good happens. And then of course, to, to move on to the, the next question, for example, something like depression or shame, not feeling good enough. Again, the question here is that like, why, why is nature animated you, you with these emotions? Is she just trying to bully you? She's just trying to make you feel terrible about yourself or make him depressed there. She's just sitting there smoking a cigarette, like doing her nails. And she's like, God, here, look, he's having a good time there. Make him depressed fucking idiot like you are and then she she presses the depression button and all everything goes wrong and you're just like oh well look i'm just depressed chemical in my brain or it's just the way i am or there's nothing i can do about it or it's just how my life is going to be it's like it is there's no logic to that at all you're not thinking through what you are if you think that about yourself you, depression happens for a reason and it's usually tied to shame it's usually tried tied to a a problem where you you don't believe in yourself you don't trust yourself you don't think you're good enough now think about that it's the exact same thing. It's a lack of standards in yourself. You, you don't think you're good enough because your standards aren't high enough. Again, the emotions are always asking for this. Oftentimes with depression, you're, you're beating yourself up quite a lot. Now, what you see in depression is maybe people with very, very strong minds and maybe quite cynical minds. For example, the right hemisphere tends to be uh, related more to depression than the left hemisphere. And this might be actually a very, very profound awareness of your fallibility, of all the ways that you can fail, of the fact that you are genuinely a fallen human who is not good enough. Now, if you can properly digest this depression and, 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 and take this in, it can create in you the humility inside of yourself that allows you to lift yourself up and actually work towards becoming good enough. It's, it, I actually think Jordan Peterson's whole philosophy is incredibly useful for something like depression because it sort of answers the emotion correctly. It's the most sophisticated and simple way to answer the emotion. Depression is like a realization of the tragedy of what you are. Like you're not perfect. You'll never be perfect. And there's so many things you cannot control and everything's going to die. It's like kind of fucking bleak when you think about it. But he sort of says, right, you can control the sort of small things around you and begin to just raise standards a little bit. Just clean your fucking room, man. Make your bed. You know, when you're working in the restaurant, just make the food a little bit better. And these tiny little raisings of standards is a humble realization that, all right, even though you're not good enough, even though you're not perfect, even though you were fallen, you still can take tiny little actions. And these little actions over a long period of time start to snowball into incredible things that will create inside of you something opposite of depression and shame, which is a very grounded, humble, and realistic pride and self 
love and understanding is that you know what even though I've, I've got all these flaws i am still able to make a positive and assertive and i'm able to raise the standards of the world and it's a big fucking idea and i think jordan really really helped a lot of people with this because it's such a um, good antidote to the problem of depression depression tends to say oh it's extremist you know it's like a shadow you get extremely cynical about everything and humility crushes you and then you're not able to sort of embrace a positive step-by-step -step path forward and of course jordan gives something small like this again working with these emotions understanding them properly can liberate you to do incredible things with your life and save yourself now what begins to happen after we get involved with all these lower emotions if you will and like lower is definitely not the correct word for them but standard emotions or basic or the first couple of steps is that you you see that once these instincts these passions are worked with the, what opens up is the possibility of having what we might understand as higher virtues the passions begin to reveal more spiritualized versions of themselves for example out of you once you connect with your body and really work at your instincts and understand how your instincts run Run through you and all this type of stuff you'll begin to notice that as you're walking around and you know maybe you're you feel lust and you're like see the beautiful girl and you're like, oh yeah i feel that i feel the lust there that's what that's what all those lads are like we see girls and we're like yeah man yeah oh yeah or you, you feel anxiety and fear and you build a connection with them and you learn that what they're trying to do is animate you towards certain goals and you understand what those goals are you'll start to notice stuff like you're walking by someone and you see a dog get hurt or you see someone get hurt or you see a poor person or something and you will you will actually feel a burst of 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 very strong uh, physiological experience you'll feel this stuff happen to you unless you're a psychopath but you'll feel this stuff happen to you very strong and you might not know what it is but that that would be the pangs of compassion that's your soul saying to you that part of you whatever way you've been built whatever way, whatever way god has designed you he's filled you full of like this lust and this fear and this anxiety and all these terrible lower hell-like emotions but there's also these other things inside of you. And the more you connect with these lower ones, the more you connect with these, these other ones, the more you're, you open up the door to a welcome into your life true compassion, true empathy and sympathy for people. And you can actually sit there and feel with people because you are someone built into your instincts. And this is how the sort of selfish, authentic Chad can actually be more compelling and more real and more human and more good than the nice guy who's got this sort of shadow inside of his head and in denial of his instincts. Because the, the Chad who's in connection with his instincts, maybe this is why we think this, the Chad who's in connection with his instincts actually feels the compassion instead of represents it to himself abstractly and intellectually and doesn't actually feel it because he doesn't like himself and he doesn't like the world as a consequence. The person who actually feels it because they've gone through the great hell of working with their desires, they live this compassion. The passion is operant within them. And when you see it, you know, it's a real compassion. You see it and you notice that this, this, this guy isn't doing it to get validation off people. You're not feeling this emotion because you want to be represented with, with uh, flowers and all these type of things. Jesus himself, for example, said, don't go and proselytize yourself in the streets go into your room and spend your time being pious with god where no one can see you because if it's not if you don't want to do that then it's not real piousness it's fake it's you doing a parody a larp if you will and this is the sort of same thing with something like compassion you can say it's a beautiful word you can say it as much as you like but if you don't actually feel it you don't actually have it you're not really being sincere you're not being a true person in the way that you think you are same for example then w what it begins to give you access to is things like ambition things like love things things really really beautiful and profound emotions and they happen in your body in a profound way you connect with your instincts and then you begin to notice that you care about things you know there's people that you really really care about there's people you don't want to be taken out of your life and you do love them and maybe even in a selfless way you would die for them in a dutiful way but do you really feel that is is that an intellectual thing or do you actually feel that because when you work with the compa the 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 instincts and build up this really strong connection with them all your nervous system switches on all the colors all the laser beams are firing and bending towards one direction of course what you'll start to feel is stronger stronger experiences of what these emotions truly are you'll feel strong love that will aggressively make you want to stand up and fight for things that will make you want to go for these type of things love is one of those great taming emotions of the lowered things because if you get angry and fight for what you love yeah, it's a very noble and compelling position to be in if you're fearful and decide to create 
easily work in order to put together what you love that's a very very powerful thing love tames sexual desire love and envy love and depression these are all very very interesting combinations that you, you can begin to see revealed inside of yourself and of course ambition then is tied to this as well ambition and love are not even that different the more you look into them but ultimately they are it is a higher emotion that's inspiring the word you would often hear is in- inspiration and the imagination usually switches on you see intellectual capacities come in alongside strong emotions the ba- great raising of your chest and desire for a great future and a great possibility and a great um, love of life and the ability for you to create things and do things this ambition switches on that you want to let your emotions guide you and drive you towards ascending and creating something more beautiful and more powerful this is a very positive emotion and can give you unbelievable levels of meaning and it's not some type of intellectual i figured out the god is dead problem because i read a load of phd papers and all these type of things it's because you went in and you worked with your body and therefore crafted and married your soul and it began to give you access to these things that you're looking for in your noggonist intellectual left hemisphere delusional copeland of of book cope and jargonism and being an information guy it's all there and all possible for you when you connect with it in this type of way so the big idea here is that you will often live a false inauthentic self you'll have the ego and the shadow and you'll have this negative experience going on for you and the thing that is always lacking what i always see is a authentic relationship with the passions and the instincts and usually there's a sort of intellectual verbal jujitsu that protects you from correctly integrating with the passions because you say to yourself that they are evil and they are bad and there's no way that they are redeemable and when you truly go and dive into the soul and really work with this schema of passions you redeem these passions and actually see that they're the ultimate animators the ultimate source of morality and higher standards and all these type of things and this will then go on to create really powerful things that people are often looking for identity level change for example where you stop seeing yourself as that humiliated loser the nice guy who doesn't deserve anything the unworthy cuck and all these type of things and instead you'll begin to see yourself as someone who's carried by a force bigger than yourself and actually believe in yourself in this type of regard and this of course is only accessible for you when you are willing to take the risk for these passions when you're willing to actually have a bit of gratitude and say god and nature have programmed me with all these forces inside of me and i'm willing to trust them i'm willing to work with them i believe in myself to be able to work with them and actually to get them to carry me forward this is how you get something inside of you in your soul to energize you and get nature on your side to love you and reward you with good feelings and motivation and all these things you're looking for in the self-help stuff and all these type of things it also teaches you so much about the orchestration and the way that the world works and the nature of all these problems you can talk about the culture war all you want but the ultimate problem is for example that the passion that is motivating what they might call the left is resentment whereas the passion that is motivating the conservatives is for example timidness and emptiness of energy complaining and whining maybe resentment as well and these type of things but who out there is standing for positive creative passion who's standing there for the sort of actual truly integrated soul energy that's screaming out of them because they've got a vision and ambition grounded in love and true connection with themselves that's actually pushing them forward i don't see that stuff very much and imagine if that came how much that would captivate us what that would feel like would that be the reason why so many people got behind someone like napoleon because he had this integration built inside of himself and he swooped across the land making people feel this energy they they felt in him a romantic hero as opposed to you know a politician who's playing on my resentments and all these type of things now for you i think the big question that i am always looking at is how do you get this process to happen in a world that is obviously so modernized and so hedonistic and all these type of problems and as i said the on a social level a lot of this stuff was was done naturally like for example if you grew up in catholic europe like you would have been introduced to something similar to this that would have done a close enough job you know it wouldn't have been perfect it would have had its downsides but it would it would have got you there in the end you know it would have done a given you a decent framework to do things and Jung, for example says this that he sees catholicism as a very very intelligent way to do things i'm sure protestantism has it in there as well i'm sure the orthodox have it too i'm sure the buddhists have it too i'm sure everybody has it in in some way or another a way to work with your instincts to try spiritualize them and divine them now my interest is that the most ancient version of this was initiation the most foundational idea was that all right in order for us to create a person to begin this process of giving someone a soul you're going to get a young boy who's going to be a coward he's going to have like a terrible relationship with his instincts i'm sure if you put him in the 
room with a girl, he'll just like, you know, he'd be a, a three second a nut job and then he'd like run out and cry in the corner or something like this. This is um, a boy is someone who's not in connection, not, not, not in connection with his soul, doesn't have any virtue in place in order to discipline these passions and isn't able to overcome them in the most foundational level. And so what they, they do in an initiation process is they take a boy out and they introduce him to the primal force of fear. They bully him, they beat the crap out of him, scare him and get him to prove that he's able to overcome the most basic emotion, which is fear and display courage in response to it, stand up and overcome this. And once you can overcome fear, you're able to overcome almost all the other emotions. You're able to overcome um, many of them because you've set that foundation for what it means to defeat an emotion and tame an emotion and stand up and do something of higher standards in response to an emotion. And that sets everything right for dealing with, you know, shame about not being good enough, anger, sexual lust, all these type of things. It all kind of clicks into gear. Now, the ancient initiation process done in the tribes is the sort of anchor and root, the, as Joseph Campbell would say, the primal f um, representation of the rituals of higher religions that you see later on. And what's so interesting about our sort of post-religious um, post secular world is that we, we threw all that stuff aside and we said, all right, we don't really need to work with the emotions anymore. And we developed instead the, this incredible technological society, completely in denial of psychology, that is full of people who are uninitiated, who don't have any understanding of how to deal with their fear. And these people walk around like these little, you know, succulent cows that basically are unable to control their passions and their emotions so that marketers can just swoop over them like vultures and just pick off their emotions and play them like puppets and all these type of things. It creates a, quite a horrific society when you think about it. And this is exactly what Nietzsche called in The Last Man. He said, this is, this is what's happening. It's, it's, it's going to get worse, by the way. The modern um, person is not an initiated, you know, you might meet a tribal guy in the desert and he might be 15, but he was initiated. And so he has this really coherent psychological profile because he's really worked with an awful lot of his fear. He believes in himself. He stands on his own feet. As um, Joseph Campbell said, the PhD guy who's 35 is still too nervous to sort of say opinions that he actually believes. And um, whereas the, the baseball player who was, you know, making decisions on the, the park since he was 12 is like, you know, 21 years old and on a TV interview and just saying things as they are because because he's initiated, he's been baptized into the realm of fear. And so what you see happening more and more now is like, you know, people going more into the education system, the institutions being crazy and all this type of stuff, and no framework, no re framework of understanding initiation. The, the shearing off of the religious framework is that we get a modern information guy being the sort of standard for what we're dealing with. So like the standard out there is low dudes. Like you can really succeed if you just raise your standards even a little bit and begin this process. The modern information guy, Noggonist, who's running around completely uninitiated, unable to to assert himself upon the world and control his emotions. He's basically just an opportunity for an OnlyFans girl to get him his anima addicted to her her girlfriend feelings and she just, she, she just extracts money out of him and then all sorts of like weird identity marketers will just pick the money out of him from another way and you just stick him in some type of job where he just oscillates through the machine and just doesn't really have a soul or a personality at all. He's just sort of a, a battery to be suckled off from everybody else. Now, you want to say to yourself, how do I, I this is sort of my generation, this is my my zeitgeist, if you will. And you want to ask yourself, how do you make sure that that is not happening to you? How do you break free from the shackles and the problems and the mistakes of your culture? There's incredible opportunities with, with the digital power that we've attained. Like, for example, me able, being able to talk to you is absolutely incredible. But the sort of psychological power we have is very, very weak and low. And so my, my interest has always been about teaching people how to self-initiate because it's something that you're ultimately going to have to take responsibility for in your life. There's, there is no organized, systematic culture out there that does this for you unless you want to join a gang or something like that and have like have them kill have them get you to kill someone or something like that you're not really going to get an initiation process anywhere so you're going to need to think about a way that you can self-initiate now the way that i've seen it always and i did this with myself is to actually sit down and study fear and make sure that you find a way to confront fear as much in your life so you develop that courage over that fear and begin that foundation to your personality where you can just do almost everything else with so much more ease because you've overcome the most debilitating emotion of all so if you actually want to sit down and and work on this. This is what the Boyo program is about. And if you want to come on board and hear more about it, you can do the free call down below. It will be in the description. It will be in the comments. Now, if like to self-initiate is about you looking at the collage of problems that you have around in your life at the moment, the situation you're in right now, and saying to yourself, all right, how do I take this 
this reality that I'm in, this situation that I'm in, and turn it into something that I can use to create this initiation. Because it would be perfect if we had my, our dads were all gathered together and actually sorted us out and got this initiation thing sorted out, but they didn't. So what you need to do is sit down and look at your exact situation and see ways that you can twist that to your favor to allow this process to happen, to make this type of stuff click into gear. So what you can do in that consultation call is sit down, have a chat with me or the member of my team, whoever will be talking to you, and sit down and have a chat about your specific situation and we can look at ways that we can turn that into habits for you or tools for you in order to begin to initiate and we'll talk to you about the program as well in that type of regard so i will talk to you all later thank you very much for listening i really enjoyed this video i think this is a top tier question and topic to talk about it's got that lovely dash of nuance but it's actually quite straightforward as well in some type of ways so i hope you enjoyed thank you very much for your time stay juicy and as i said pop down on the call to work with people to work with me properly to actually talk to me week by week by week week in week out and this is the way to do it on the boyo program so i look forward to talking talking to you all later. Stay juicy. Bye-bye.